our wrestling is not against blood and flesh, but against the principalities, against powers, against the world rulers of this darkness, against the spiritual hosts of evil in the heavenly places. Now the devil is the enemy of every believer, and there is a demonic world around us today, and it's manifesting itself at the present hour. wickedness and the deceit and the lying and the cunning and the murder and the rape and the pillaging and all of that that Satan can bring down upon mankind. Grace raised us above it. Righteousness is greater than it. And all of these graces come forth from God the Father through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. chapter 10, and last week we were in Pentecost, right, it was the week of, well, the 50th, right, the, the birth of the church, if you will, right, the, that, we, that we celebrated last week, right, in the book of Acts. But now we continue on in the apocalyptic prophetic book of Daniel again, chapter 10, so if you have your Bibles, anybody need a Bible? Raise your hand, we'll get your Bible, anybody? You all good? You guys are Awesome. And we're in chapter 10. Previously in chapter 9, if you remember, it was what? Daniel talked about, there was the prophecy of the 70 weeks, right? And the prophecy of God's plan, you see. God has a plan. And here it is in the Old Testament, the book of Daniel, that plan is laid out in chapter 9 in the 70 weeks, which we are now, we're still in the plan, but the plan kind of stopped at 400 and 63 weeks, right? When Jesus came in on triumphal entry, crucifixion, and then what happened? It all time stopped, and the church, the church ages entered into the scene, which is where we are now. And that's coming to a close. That's coming to a close. As we come into the 70th week, because now there's 69 weeks, the last week is coming. The seven-year tribulation is coming. We'll be out of here with the rapture. We talked about that already. So that's where we kind of left off. With God's plan... So you know God's plan now. You're in the church age, right? We're part of God's plan. It's for Israel, but it's for all humanity. It's for the church. So here we go into chapter 10. And here Daniel is his vision again. And it's, it's a pretty, pretty hard vision for Daniel. So let's read chapter 10 together. Let's read the verses together. Hopefully you have your Bibles open. And it says here in chapter 10, In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. The message was true, but the appointed time was long, and he understood the message, and he had understanding of the vision. Verse 2, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant food, no meat or wine came into my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all, till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Now on the 24th day of the first month, I was by the side of the great river that is the Tigris. I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose waist was girded with gold of Uphaz. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like the torches of fire, his arms and feet like burnished bronze in color, and the sound of his words like the voice of a multitude. Verse 7, And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. 
For the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great terror fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone when I saw the great vision, and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned to frailty in me, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. Here come some of the prophecies now. Verse 10, suddenly a hand touched me which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. And I have come because of your words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days. And behold, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to me. That's Michael the archangel, right? For I had been left alone there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to you to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days. For the vision refers to many days yet to come. We're talking about the future here now. He says, when he had spoken such words to me, I turned my face toward the ground and suddenly became speechless. And then suddenly, one having like the likeness of the sons of men touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke, saying to him who stood before me, My Lord, because of the vision, my sorrows have overwhelmed me, and I have retained no strength. For how can this servant of my Lord talk with you, my Lord? As for me... No strength remains in me now, nor is there any breath left in me. Then again, the one having the likeness of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O oh man, greatly beloved, what does he say? Fear not, fear not, peace be to you. Be strong, yes, be strong. So when he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, do you know why I have come to you? And now I must return to the fight with the prince of Persia. And when I have gone forth, indeed, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is noted in the scripture of truth. No one upholds me against these except Michael, your prince. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we pray these scriptures this morning be written on our hearts, Lord, in a way that only the Holy Spirit can, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would fill me right now with the words, Lord, through the Spirit to come back, Lord, in a way where we can grab, grasp onto things and utilize these words of the Old Testament in our own lives, Lord, to give us hope, to give us victory, to give us knowledge, to keep us pursuing and having perseverance in the faith, Lord. And that's what I pray this morning, that our hearts would be touched in that way. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So... Here, I kind of almost, what you see here is a war. There's a war going on in this chapter. And in this war, the war is in the heavenly places, places that we can't see. We can't see that. And, and that's what's going to kind of describe this chapter. And this chapter kind of reveals to us and shows us, as you just read this, and I hope you go back and read it tonight. Read it tonight, and maybe some, you hear something this, this morning that you can relate to, and go back and read this tonight, and see if God reveals something else to you this, uh, this evening. But this chapter reveals to us like a, it's almost like a, a cosmic struggle, if you will. A cosmic struggle between who? The forces of good, and what else? The forces of evil. Is there any other, is there any other way? Really. What is it doing? It's telling us of the angels this chapter is telling us of angels and demons. That's right, angels and demons that are locked in a, they're almost kind of locked like in a, they're in like a mortal combat. They're in a mortal combat. Somewhere between heaven and earth. Grasp onto that picture. It's, it's, here, I'll give you some. It's kind of like Star Wars, but it's not science fiction, it's real. This is real. This is a real battle going on here in this chapter. And to get really kind of, I found this, this quote uh, from a Welsh, a Welsh preacher. Uh, his name was Jeff Thomas. And here, to get a perspective of what's going on here, here's, here's what he said. He said, 
And this is you and I. This is us. Wherever there is a flock of Christ's sheep, there are wolves that want to destroy them. Whenever the church advances, dark principalities are set at work. Do you grasp that? This, you're in a battle. We're in a battle. You're sitting in that chair. You're in a battle right now. That's what we're talking about this morning. And both sides of that quote, what I just read, are true. They're true because God's, whether you believe this or whether you see this or not, we're sitting here, here in Berkeley, but God's church is advancing throughout the world. You may not see it because they're not going to tell us that. They're not going to tell us that God's church is growing in China or in uh, the, the Saudi Arabia or any of these countries. They're not going to tell us that, but God's church is advancing in the Middle East to the Arabs. But dark principalities are at work. Always remember that. And we see that because because whenever the Lord, and whenever, and think about our church right now, whenever, whenever the Lord is, he makes an advance or he's pushing forward through the darkness, right? God's pushing forward, and he is. God's going through the darkness, and we're going with him. And we push forward, Satan's always ready to strike back. Remember that. Satan's always ready to strike back. Daniel 10, this chapter, helps us understand this, why we encounter then you probably know this already in your heart, why you and I encountered delays and difficulty in our service with Christ. Isn't it true? Don't we, don't we? You probably all could come up here and give a testimony to that. And what it does here, I see in this chapter, and it kind of set me down a path there, that it tells us and helps us understand this, why sometimes our prayers are sometimes hindered. Do you ever feel that way? Your prayers are hindered? And, and sometimes they're delayed. Your prayers are delayed for like a long season. Has anybody gone through that? Of course you have. Of course you have. Sometimes for years. Sometimes for years. Daniel 10. Here's what Daniel 10 is. For me, what I saw, what God showed me that I could show you this morning. It's kind of a peek behind the curtain of, of history. It's kind of a look. We're going to look and kind of look and see, whoa, this is what's really going on. And Daniel gives us, this book of Daniel, this chapter gives us kind of like a rare, and you could call it a rare kind of insight into the things that are normally what we would see, what we would say invisible. There's things that you can't see, and I can't see right now, but they're going on all around us. I don't know if you believe that. I do. It's a view, here's what it is. What Daniel is seeing here, or what he's not seeing, it's a view from the seen to the unseen, and then from the visible to the invisible, and then from the natural to the supernatural. So here, let me give you a quick background here of chapter 10, of Daniel 10. It begins with a chronological note, if you read the first verse, right? It says, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar, right? The message was true, and we read that verse 1. This tells us that, here's what this tells us, that Daniel receives this revelation, right, in this chapter, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, he was the king of Persia right now, Cyrus is the king, in 536 B.C. Now that's, now that's really an important date to remember because that's the year, remember the Jewish exile? When all the Jews were taken up to Babylon for 70 years? That's the year the exile ended. That's a very important thing to remember. 536 B.C., under Cyrus, the exile ends and the first group of Jews, where they go? They go back to Jerusalem. Ah, that's, wouldn't you think, you'd say, wow, we're free. But you know what? Only about 50,000 of them went. I say only, because there's probably was well over a million of them. Only 50,000 went in the first wave. They went home that year. Daniel wasn't among them, though. Daniel was not among them, probably because of this. As, as I get older, I think I can relate to this. Probably because he was, his age was advanced. He was probably getting close to 90 years of age. I don't think he could travel too well. So here Daniel, and, probably, and that was probably, an, I'll use this word, it was kind of an arduous journey, if you will. So he kind of stayed behind. But more likely this, here's what I think. God probably simply told him this, that he had more work to do in Babylon. He had more work to do in Babylon for him to do, for Daniel to do. Daniel, you stay here. I got work for you here. I know you want to maybe want to go home with your people, but you got to stay here. Doesn't God do that sometimes to us? You want to go somewhere and God says, oh, 
Hold on, you're not going anywhere, I need you here. Daniel 10 introduces us to the final, here's what it does. This is important. As we're going to finish this book in the next couple of weeks, Daniel 10 introduces us to the final vision of the book. So chapter 10, which we read this morning, is what we would call like a prologue, um, an introduction, uh, a preface, uh, a prelude to chapter 11, to chapter 12, which chapter 11 is a vision itself, and chapter 12 gives us the aftermath of the vision of chapter 11 and then the close of the book. Whoa, where do we get to those two chapters? So basically, Daniel received this revelation of the future. Remember, we're talking about the future here. That involves his people, right? The people of Israel and the, and the nation of Israel. And the last days. The last days that are coming. And then the last great war that is coming. And we'll see that later in Daniel 11. It contains, and Daniel 11 contains this revelation of Israel's history, as we'll see. And what does it culminate in? Chapter 11? To the rise of the Antichrist. Remember we talked about the Antichrist? To the rise of the Antichrist in the final days before the return of who? Say it. Jesus. Really, Jesus is coming. You guys believe that, don't you? He's coming. Jesus is coming. And this revelation of this great war we see that Daniel will engulf with Israel, uh, it sent... When Daniel got this vision, what happened to him? He got sad. He went into mourning. He got this vision because he saw what, what the end days were like. And by the way, thank the Lord we're not going to be here. Thank the Lord we're not going to be here. But Daniel saw this vision and it went into mourning. He almost, I think he got sick from it. He got sick from it. Because what, what did the scriptures tell us? It said for three weeks he fasted, he prayed, he, ate, he was eating no food, he was drinking no wine, he was using no lotions, he was not trying to take care of himself. Meaning he didn't, he didn't shower or use any deodorant. And at the end of those three weeks, he, what does it say? He was standing by the Tigris River, and when he saw this amazing thing, I think this would be amazing too, if we, if we were standing somewhere by the Tom's River here, just imagine this. Daniel 5 and 6, in chapter 10, he says, Man, picture yourself here in the Tom's River. I looked up, and therefore before me was a man dressed in linen with the belt of the finest gold around his waist. His body was like chrysolite, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, his voice like the sound of the multitude. He's not identified, right? It doesn't tell you who it is, does it? The description to me sounds very much like the appearance of who? The Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation. Right? In Revelation chapter 1. If you want to open it up and read it. It's amazing how those books are connected. Daniel's, and here's Daniel's response. I don't know if this would be our response. Imagine that picture out here around Tom's River and we see something, what we just described here. What does Daniel do? He falls on his face. He falls on his face before, I believe it's Jesus. I believe that Daniel has encountered the pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the experience was too much for him. I think it would probably be too much. If Jesus, my gosh, can you imagine if he strolled in here right now? I think it would be so too much for us in some aspects. And that's what happened to him. He passed out. He passes out on the ground. And later, what happens is a hand reaches down and touches him and tells him to do what? Come on, Daniel, stand up. Get off the ground, Daniel. I believe that hand belonged not to Jesus, but to an angel sent by Jesus. You see? An angel came to help him as he was laying face down on the ground, mourning. And this angel proceeds to tell Daniel that, he's telling Daniel, Daniel, your prayer has been heard. Your prayer has been heard. When? The moment, the exact moment he began praying at the start of his 21-day fast. So when he prayed that, it was heard immediately. It wasn't like, oh, it's Daniel's prayer. Let me put this over here. I got a couple other ones I got to listen to. No, it was heard immediately by God. Why then had why then had the answer taken so long to arrive? 
The angel, here's the angel's explanation. And I think it's almost kind of mind-blowing in a way. He says that he, the angel says this, he's been hindered. Why is the angel, why is he hindered? He's hindered by demonic opposition between heaven and earth. See, the angels get hindered. That's a, well, I'll read that to you right now. 12 and 13, verses 12 and 13. Do not be afraid, Daniel. Here's the angel speaking. Since the first day I sent you, you sent, sent your mind to gain understanding <laughs> and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard. You see, you pray, God hears you. If you pray right now, God hears that prayer right at that, that moment. Let's say he's answering it right now. But he hears it right at that moment. He says, uh, set your mind to gain understanding and humble yourself before God. Your words were heard and I have come in response to them. So God sends the angel. He says, I'm responding to your prayers, Daniel. But the prince of Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. He's fighting. He's fighting. With, he's actually fighting with Satan here. And it says here, then Michael... Michael the archangel, right? One of the chief princes came to me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Meaning Michael came to help him. He needed help. The prince of the Persian kingdom cannot... So you might think, oh, that's, that's got to be a man, right? It can't be a man. Because no man... Listen. No man can stop an angel sent by God. You, if an angel comes, you can't stop him. If God sends that angel into your life, into whatever. You can't stop them. So that Persian king is not a man. It must be some kind of demonic force, kind of, assigned by Satan to serve Satan, the Persian king, if you will. And most likely his job was to hinder God's work. And that's always going on around us. God's work... Satan is always trying to hinder God's work. Even in this church right now, he's trying to hinder us. I, he's trying to hinder us. You guys got to pray right now. Pray every night. Pray on your knees for this church right now. Satan is trying to hinder us. Trying to, he's trying to separate us out right now. He's going to try and separate us out. Oh, you don't have a place to go anymore. Oh, yes, we do. We have a God that's going to take care of us. I believe that. He must be a strong. And this demon, because that's what he is. This demon must be strong. These, some of these demons are very powerful. Because all by himself, he stopped this demon, stopped an angel cold for 21 days. He stopped this angel from getting to Daniel for 21 days. That's how powerful the demons are. Then Michael, who I said is the archangel, and I don't know if you realize this, but Michael, the angel, he has an assignment. You know what his assignment is? To guard Israel. That's what he does. That's his assignment, to guard Israel. Michael the archangel. He intervenes for Israel. And ultimately he's going to be able to complete the mission. And at the end of this chapter, we get even more, and we see more about angels going forward. And Daniel chapter, look, uh, the comings and goings, if you will, of angels. Let's read 20 verses 20 and go all the way to, well, let's, I'll read 20, almost to chapter 11. Soon I will return to fight against the... Here's what he says. I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. When I go, the prince of Greece will come, but I, first I will tell you what is written in the book of truth. No one supports me against them except Michael, your prince. And in the first year of Darius the Mede, I took my stand to support and protect him. What this is telling us here is that the angel... This angel has left his warfare. He's left his warfare that's to come to Daniel and will soon go back to his heavenly ba battle. Because there's always a battle going on. There's always a battle. There's always a battle going on all around here right now. And soon what's going to happen is he's going to fight the prince of Persia. Ultimately, that's going to be the Antichrist. And again later, he'll take on the prince of Greece. But he also tells Daniel that two years earlier, he, he interceded to help out Michael, perhaps fighting against the prince of Persia. But in the way you look at all this, you probably, it probably gets all maybe sometimes convoluted to you, and it gets like, it almost becomes kind of mysterious, really. It almost becomes mysterious because 
If it is to be taken literally, because I think that's the way we have to take this, literally. When you read the Word of God, take it literally. Take it for what it says. It tells us these goings-on, where? In the invisible realm. There's an invisible realm all around us where demons, here's what's going on all around you right now, demons and angels are duking it out. I'll just use that term. They're duking it out. They're, they're against, they're fighting each other right now. A spiritual way, a spiritual fight. To, and here's what's going on. These angels and demons are fighting to promote or obstruct God's work in the world. And we see it going on right now in such a heightened level. There is such a spiritual fight going on right now that it's almost, you could taste it. You can almost taste it. And I think for some of us, it's made us, and we got to be careful of this, that it's, sometimes it's getting to us with anxiety and depression and, and feeling like, what else, what else can we stand, Lord? I know a lot of us, are, and, and you don't see it. It creeps up on you. It kind of creeps up on you. That's why we got to stay in the Word. That's why we got to pray. That's why we got to stick together. If this sounds a little too much for us this morning, I'm going to go back to a couple of teachings we had in Ephesians. Remember Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12? What does it tell us? Here's where our struggle is. Right now, on this face of this earth, right now, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. This is Paul. But against the rulers, against the authorities. Ah, we can see that pretty clearly, huh? Your, my struggle isn't with you or, or any of us. Our struggle is with who? The rulers that are in charge right now, the authorities that are in charge. We're so against that because there's such, there's such evil in it. And he says here, Paul, the struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil, where? In the heavenly realms. This verse, I, I think this is verse is really helpful for us on a few different levels here. First, first of all, it kind of reminds us that our battle is not against, my battle is not against you. Your battle is not against me. It really isn't. It truly is. Oh yeah, we get into our tiffs and beefs with each other. But the spiritual battle, well, gosh, I hope it's not a spiritual battle between us. And it shouldn't be. Because sometimes, you know, and I know we do focus this as Christians, right? We say, well, we focus on uh, uh, abortion rights, pornographers, godless politicians that we have, uh, corrupt business leaders that we see in the world, drug dealers, uh, and this perversion of filth all around us right now. And we look at it and go, that's the source of our problems. That's the source of our problems. And they are in kind of sort of way. Yet those people that I just talked about, these uh, these people that purvey filth and godless politicians and business leaders that are corrupt. You know what? They're, those people are just unwitting, I'll use the word dupes, if you will. They're unwitting dupes of a powerful spiritual force. Most of them don't even realize they're under. They don't even know it. They know nothing about it. And we've seen that in Scripture before, haven't we? They're, but the, here's the thing. They're going to be morally culpable for their choices. They'll be held accountable. You can rest assured, everyone that we see right now that we all kind of can point out and say, that's evil, that's wrong, that's corrupt, that's filth, that's, that's injustice, it'll be all taken care of. They're all going to be called to judgment. You don't have to, you don't have to be, uh, look, we can pray, right? We can pray for them. But don't get, and I'm saying this to myself, so we don't get caught up in it, that we get sidetracked, because that's what the devil wants to do right now. Sidetrack us. They're rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, these spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. It's not real superly clear how we should differentiate between them, but perhaps probably it's enough for us to know that there are various types of angels. There's different types of angels. So the demons if you will, this battle that's going on, do you realize these demons are organized? They're just not like a flip-flop operation. They're very organized. They're very organized. And they, they serve different purposes for Satan's service. But, and finally, we look at this verse from Paul. He says, here it is, guys. We studied this book, put on the whole armor of God. That's what it tells us. Put on the, not some of the pieces, not one piece, all the whole armor of God. Because our godly character, your godly character, my godly character, actually does, it does make a day-to-day -day difference. 
whether you believe it or not. It's true. You exude that godly character to someone that is in your family. You may not think so, but it makes a difference. It makes a difference. Just see how people interact with you. Not only for us, but this great struggle for good and evil. We can stand in the gap in between good and evil. We should be, right? We're all, look, look at it this way. We're all kind of like, we're kind of like soldiers. We're kind of like soldiers right now in this invisible war, if you will, that stretches across this whole universe right now. Not just here, over the whole universe. There's a battle going on. I know it's almost kind of mind-bending, isn't it? When Daniel 10, it may seem like kind of unusual, it, it corresponds really well. This is why you've got to read the whole counsel of of God, from the gener of Genesis to Revelation, because Daniel 10, you can't just say, well, I'm just going to read the New Testament. Daniel 10, it, it, it corresponds really well with a lot of things that go on in the New Testament. You see, I remember reading, the, when I first was saved, I read the New Testament, and I do, you, just like anyone saved in the beginning, you go, ah, I can't make this connect. This sounds all crazy. But then when you start going back to putting your hand in the glove, if you will, you saw, whoa, here it is. Daniel, Revelation, there's connection. Ezekiel, they all come together because it's God's plan like we talked about. So here's some of the things we don't know for certain. Just real quick. Because, again, this chapter is just a little peek behind what's coming. It's just a little peek what's coming. And it leaves, and it's, it leaves me, I hope... I, and, and it's, it's good to do this. It leaves us with a lot of questions, probably in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit, that you can't answer. But that's okay. If you can't answer, if sometimes you read the scriptures and you sit there and you go, man, I, I can't answer it. I, don't, I can't get that. That's okay. Just keep reading. Let the Holy Spirit lead and guide you. He will. He'll show you. If that's your heart, God will show you. For instance, what happened in the 21, well, listen, in the 21 days that the angel and the prince of Persia were contending together, where they were fighting the angel and Satan. The text tells us this, of a conflict, but gives no hint. It tells us there's a conflict going on, but it doesn't tell us how it played out. See, that's a mystery to us. It doesn't tell us. That's where faith comes in. That's where our faith comes in. We also want to know exactly, I know I want to know, what exactly Michael the archangel did in the end that finally won. Finally won that battle. And it... And I think of Jesse here. I think like going like a, a WWE match, wrestling match, all these angels and say like the super, like a super slam going on in, in the realm, the realm of evil and good, right? The angels and the demon are fighting. They're locked in, locked in this struggle, right? And Michael comes running in. He comes running into the ring, kind of sorta, and he's got all this smoke and laugh. That's just a good picture, isn't it? That he jumps on the top rope there and he comes on down and he he does some moves and he pins the devil. That's just me. I'm crazy. I'm crazy. I think that way. But I'm sure it wasn't. I'm sure it's nothing like that. But it's a good visual, isn't it? Boom. Here, devil. Boom. But I'm sure it wasn't anything like that. But we can't say with certainty what exactly happened in that fight. But it's simply probably that we can't even conceive. And I know I can sometimes. We can't even conceive how, conceive how spirit beings, spirit beings, can contend with one another, each other. Have you ever thought about that? How does that go on? If we knew, if probably if we had the answer, if we had the full-fledged answer, it would probably, probably wouldn't even make sense to us. Really, truly, seriously. It wouldn't make, probably wouldn't make sense of us. Then there's other questions that come up. How are the demons and angels organized? Well, it's clear there are ranks and angels in the hierarchy of demon spirits. And how do those angels work together to defeat demons? Well, we don't have enough answers for that. But here, there's one practical basis for this. We like to know how our prayers, and prayers are vital now, in this battle between good and evil, this battle that's going on all around us. You know what's powerful for you and I? Prayer. Prayer. Now that's where we get into it. Prayer. And that's practical for us. It's not mysterious. It's practical. And we like to know that our prayers are affecting what's going on right now in the heavenly realms and the heavenly warfare that's all around us. Wouldn't you like to know that your prayers are being affected, that Satan and angels are fighting it out, and ultimately Jesus wins? Maybe our prayers, you know what? Maybe you think this way. Somehow your prayers, you, maybe we're giving strength to some weary angels right now. Those angels are fighting for us. 
Maybe we're giving them strength in our prayers when they're fighting for us, giving them aid to, in their combat. They're fighting right now. And all we can say for certain is that there's a connection. There is, look, there's a connection between our prayers and the spirit realm. Did you ever think of that? There's a connection between your prayers and the spirit realm. That's all around us. That's, that's, why, that's why Paul says in, in, in Ephesians 6, 12, he says wrestling. There's wrestling going on. And we wrestle through prayer, don't we? Don't we do that? We wrestle through prayer and obedience to God and putting on the armor of God. We do wrestle with that, don't we? And through these very activities that we go through, this prayer, we enter this realm of invisible spiritual warfare. Have you ever felt that? Have you ever felt that spiritual warfare going on within your spirit? Oh, I, I, I think a lot of us probably feel that almost every day now. So we like to know that the demons and angels are assigned to every nation on the earth. Did you ever think of that? Outside of Daniel 10, there's no passage in the Bible that tells us about spirit beings being assigned to specific nations. So I don't think there's any hierarchy in that vein. So look, we, we can come and talk about angels all we want right now, but I think the principle we should follow is this. The only things we should know for sure about the spiritual realm are those things that are clearly revealed. Here's, here it is. The things that are clearly revealed in the Word of God. That's what, you, that's what you have to be concerned about, you and I. The things that are revealed in that book you're holding and about the spiritual realm, because realm, Paul talks about it in, in, in Ephesians chapter 6. Because everything else would be speculation. We'd, just, we'd be thinking, well, is it this way? Is it that way? Just go to the Word of God. Go to the Word of God. You'll figure it out. God will show you. God will give you the strength. God will give you the hope. God will give you the perseverance to keep going. Because it's important, look, it's not, it's important not to do the, to, to go beyond the scriptures at any point with respect to demons. You, you, you can't, you, you don't want to tangle with a demon. You don't. Don't think you're going to rebuke a demon or you're going to bind them up or, no, 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 no. Don't think that way. Go into the word of God. You want, you want, you want, Faith and strength go to the Word of God. Because evangel evangelicals, who we are, we believe that the Bible tells us, don't you believe this? I pray you do. That the Bible tells us everything we need to know about the spirit world. The Bible tells us. The Bible tells us. You don't have to sit there and kind of get con you know, all confused about it. And that everything the Bible says is true. Does everyone believe that? Right? Amen. And there's no, and there really is, I know the world wants to tell us these things, but there's really no other authoritative voice or a source for information regarding demons and angels. There's all kinds of creepy books you could probably read, but they're all what, I, what they are. They're creepy books. First Timothy tells us, he's, here's what Timothy tells us about the Word of God. He says, seriously, when it says that the Bible is God-breathed and is given to make us thoroughly equipped for what? For teaching, correcting, rebuking, training in righteousness. So the written Word of God is this, that we have everything we need in that book right now. First Peter tells us, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Remember this. Our only authority in the spiritual realm is the Bible. Is the Bible itself. Don't go to no Ouija boards. Don't go, don't go looking in your astrology. The Bible is the authority. Not human experience. We should believe everything that Bible says. That's the first thing. You should believe everything that Bible says. And we shouldn't go beyond what the Bible says. Start making things up on your own. You know, your addendums to the Bible. I've seen some Christians do that. They, they, they add things to the Bible. And you start to go, oh, no, 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 you're, you're going down the wrong track there. Because it's important to remember that Daniel, Daniel wouldn't have known anything. Think about this. In Daniel here, especially in chapter 10, he wouldn't have known anything about the conflict with the prince of Persia, if you will, if the angel had not told him. He didn't know anything about it. He had no knowledge of the supernatural struggle that was going on between until the angel revealed it to him. In, in other words, God reveals it to the angel and the angel revealed it to Daniel. So here's the things we can be sure about. All right, you ready? We'll wrap up this message. It's important for us to do, to focus on what we can learn from Daniel 10. Because you know what? Be honest with you, when I first read it, and I found out, I read, did some research on this, a lot of people, it's just, this chapter kind of gets kind of, just people want to go right to 11 and 12. 
But you got to understand what Daniel was going through here. And here's some of these, and I'll give you some key, what I call these key statements, if you will. And there's five of them that I want you to think about. That going way back in the beginning of the message, here's the first one. Prayers of believers are immediately heard by God. You guys in that? Immediately. The angel tells us that in verse 12, that his prayers, Daniel's prayers, were heard in the heaven, from heaven the moment he sought wisdom from God. So you right now, if you prayed and lifted up a prayer to the Lord right now, it's heard immediately. It's heard immediately. That's one thing to remember here. And that should encourage you. That should encourage you because uh, if you wonder sometimes, and I know we, pro I know we all do this, are you really listening, God? Are you really hearing my prayers? Uh, how come I'm not getting... And that's... The thing is, here, it's, it's going to go up, but now we're going to have to wait and see what God wants to do. God hears us. God hears us when we pray. He hears us. He hears our petitions. He hears our petitions. They reach Him the moment we pray, and they're formed in your heart. Maybe you even have a prayer in your heart right now. God knows that prayer. How about that? God knows that prayer. He hears us if, you know what, let me see if you can grasp onto this. God hears your prayer as if you're the only one speaking to him. How about that? I think that's pretty, you're pretty important to God, right? He hears your prayer like you're the only one talking to him. Here's a second truth. Unseen, and it's all around us right now, it may be even in here right now, Unseen spiritual warfare may be at times delay answers to our prayers. How about that? Spiritual warfare going on right now sometimes delays prayer. Depends on maybe how you handle it, right? What happened to Daniel could also happen to us. It may be sometimes for you. I know for me, our heart, you ever have those deepest heartfelt prayers and, and you're, you sometimes feel like they're delayed because of, and I'll call this like static maybe coming from the other side of that spiritual realm. There's a battle going on in your mind. Oh, yeah, you're praying to God? What are you wasting your time for? Did ever, ever, the ever, devil, devil tell you that in your head? What are you wasting your time praying for? He's not, he doesn't care about you. He doesn't care about your circumstances. Why don't you just go on doing what you're doing? That's, that's static. That's spiritual warfare going on in your prayers. I don't know if that's ever happened to you. I, I think it, that happens to me quite often sometimes. I mean, it, but look, pray with assurance, though. Pray with assurance that God hears you. God hears us that if we're the only one speaking to him. And this unspiritual warfare, what happens to Daniel, these angels and demons battle in the visible realm, it's, it's going to happen. Look. It's going to happen to us when we pray about God and his cause on this earth. We're going to get attacked. We're going to get attacked. And as we really enter into serious intercession for unreached people, like when we're out there and you want to get in that moment where you want to tell someone about Jesus, do you ever feel like sometimes you got concrete feet or you're, you can't say anything? That's spiritual warfare. That's spiritual warfare. It's in your heart, but the devil knows how to mess you up. He knows how to say, you can't, talk, you can't talk to this person about God. You're not that smart. You don't know nothing about God. So don't even open your mouth. Ah, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in, though. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in for us. But we're, look, you're going to pray. You're going to come into difficulties. You're going to come. Here, I'll give you an example. You pray for your loved ones, right? You pray for your loved ones to be saved. I know a lot of you do. I've talked to you. You pray your loved ones are to be saved. And for our maybe prodigal children, some of us have prodigal children, to come to return to the Lord. Right? We've prayed that. I know a lot of us have prayed. I don't want to raise your hand because probably a lot of us would raise your hand. We shouldn't be surprised, though. We shouldn't be surprised that those prayers are not immediately answered. And they're not, right? I've been praying. I'll, I'll tell you a list of people. And I say, wow, Lord, I've been praying for these people. Are they ever going to come to you? It's not, it's not me. I, I don't make that choice. It's their heart that has to change. That's what you have to give up in your prayer. But you just got to keep praying, right? Satan, you know what? Satan hates that kind of praying. Satan hates that kind of praying. When you pray for your loved one, or you pray for enemies in your life, or you pray for, he hates that when you pray. 
He hates when you pray for someone to be saved or come to Jesus. Just remember what you're dealing with here. Spiritual warfare. Because it's, you know why he hates it? Because it's a direct attack on his kingdom. Or what he thinks is his kingdom anyway. He's going to, look, Satan's not going to give up. He's not going to give up without a fight. And that's in your life, too. He's not going to give up. You're in a fight. You're in a fight. I'm not saying this to bum you out. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to raise you up and be warriors and be ready. To be ready in the full armor of God. Here's a third one. Maybe you felt this way. Have you ever wrestled in your prayer? Right, Remember Jacob, he wrestled with God. <laughs> he wrestled with God and he, he wouldn't let go. He was wrestling. He was wrestling with God. And sometimes when you wrestle with God, it could be exhausting. Has that ever happened to you? You wrestle with God, you're waiting for answers, you're going back and forth, and you're like, oh, I can't do this anymore. I can't. I'm exhausted, Lord, with this praying. But Daniel, he fasted, he fasted for 21 days while he sought, he sought the Lord. See? For 21 days. And then he falls on his face and he meets the Lord Jesus right by the Tigris River. And then he bows down on the ground, totally exhausted. And then he hears the angel's explanation of the spiritual warfare that's all around him. And that's serious business, Daniel. And we, you and I, were locked in this battle against spiritual forces that are vast beyond your comprehension. You're not going to lose, though. That's what I'm saying. Don't think, oh, we lost. No, we win. We win. Because unless... And I'll say this to you, church, this morning. Unless we rely completely on the Lord, we're going to be defeated. You're going to be defeated. Unless your life, and I'm going to say not 10%, 20%, 100% you rely on the Lord. No, 150% you rely on the Lord. If you don't, you're going to be defeated. I don't know what that means for you. It's different for every person. I don't know. But if you... If you don't rely completely on the Lord, sometimes I think we just give a little bit at a time, you know? It's, because it's easy, right? I hear people, oh, Lord, bless me, uh, uh, bless my family, bless the way we're eating this morning or having this dinner. Uh, thank you for this food, amen. Okay, well, that's all right, prayer. That's good. It's not going to cause Satan to tremble, though. Satan's going, well, let him eat. They'll get fat, they'll get high cholesterol, they'll get a little, they'll have them go to the hospital, <laughs> let them eat. He don't care. That's not a guy. Satan could care less about that prayer. It's a, I mean, it's a good prayer, it is. Don't get me wrong, we should give thanks to the Lord. But it's time, you know what it is? Here it is. I'm going to tell you, church, right now. It is time for us to raise the bar. Raise the bar and enter in serious spiritual warfare. Raise the bar. You're capable, because God equips you. God equips you for the fight. He doesn't let you stand there helpless and get... You think the Lord wants you to stand there helpless in the world and just get arrows shot at you until you can't stand it? No, he doesn't want that. He wants you to contend. He wants you to get in there in a spiritual battle. It's serious business with the Lord. So raise the bar in your life. Raise the bar in your life. Here's the fourth thing. If we could see, if we could see, think about this. If you could see the invisible... We would be, if this curtain, just say these were curtains, and they lifted up, and you were able to see the invisible realm all around us, you'll be, you would see good and evil fighting with each other. You would see it. And I think we'd probably all pass out. I think we'd probably, we would, we'd probably be, our eyes would we'd probably take a step back. Daniel 10 tells us that behind the movement, and it is, Behind the movement of men and nations, unseen spiritual forces are at work. Do you think that's not going on in our country right now? And here's, the, here's what I see that's kind of worrying me. That I think, not just us, not just us, I think a lot of people are just going, they're getting numb. They're getting numb to everything. They're, getting, they're not fighting back. I'm not saying fighting back, punching people. Or at, they're not fighting back right now because... There's a lot of things that are tugging at us right now, trying to tear us apart as a country, as a family, as fathers and husbands and mothers and uncles and cousins. All of us families being trying to be torn apart right now. But don't get numb to the war. Don't get numb to the fight because that's when you're susceptible to being defeated spiritually, not just physically. 
Daniel 10 tells us this, that no one could have known simply by looking at the, the Persian court, if you will, that a great battle was going on. You didn't see it because it was between the angel and the prince of Persia. But when the curtains pull back, we see angels and demons battling against each other while, you, while the human leaders around this world are totally unaware. They're all focused on their own wealth and their own prosperity and their own power. That's who's leading us. Satan, Satan will do this. He'll often use emissaries to influence government. Do you believe that? It's true. I've seen it. He'll use, he'll use intermediaries to influence government leaders to turn us against God. You don't think that's happening? Look what they're trying to perpetuate on us. All the things. It's not just the leaders. Satan's putting people in there to perpetuate that. It was true in, it was true in Persia and it was true in Greece. And it's true in Washington. It is. It's probably true in Trenton too. This chapter here, as we come to the end. The chapter here proves this conclusively. This, it does. This, it proves this conclusively. That Satan does not believe in the separation of church and state. He's, he does. He really doesn't care. He has no problem. Satan has no problem using evil to harass us and to hinder us in the work of God in the world. But there's an look, and I really end it here. There's another encouraging side to all of this. There really is. Listen, in 2 Kings, in the book of 2 Kings, I don't know if you remember the story. It tells of a time of the, there was a mighty army the mighty army of Syria, it surrounded the Israelites. The army surrounded the Israelites in a city called Dothan. And kind of, think about this, you're in the middle of it and you're surrounded by this army. You're saying, we're dead. We're finished. It's over. But Elisha, his servant, he sees the armies of the enemy on every hand. He sees the enemy and he cries out, what shall we do? You, we would probably do that. What are we going to do? We're in trouble. Elisha, he answers with words that to us probably wouldn't make any sense if you were in that situation. He says, those who are with us are more than those who are with them. What? What are you talking about, Elijah? There's thousands of Syrian army around us. We're only a little ragtag group. What are you talking about, Elisha? Elijah sees something totally different. Elisha, he asked, what, what did Elijah do, Elisha do? He asked the Lord to open the eyes of his servant. And when he's, he asked for that, maybe you should do that too. Open your eyes. Hey, Lord, open the eyes of my heart. When the servant of the Lord, he looks around Elisha, and he sees above, he sees above the army of Syria, flaming chariots. Flaming chariots of what? The army of God. That's above the whole, the, the Syrian army. They're in trouble, the Syrian. <laughs> Elijah sees it and he goes, we, we're going we're to win now. But he had to open his eye. He had to call out to the Lord. Sometimes, even us, right, if we could only see beyond the visible around us, boy, it would really sometimes be helpful. It, it probably would be, right? But we can't, which is why the story of Daniel 10 is so crucial. It reminds us this, that just because we can't see something, listen, just because we can't see something doesn't mean it isn't there. You see? Right? Do you believe it? That's, our, that's faith, right? Because if, if for one second we could truly see with the eyes of God, we'd probably see a vast array of supernatural beings all around us. It would, it, I, I don't think we would be able to see, capable of, to handle that. I think that's why God does that for us. You'd see angels, demons all around us. There's much, look... We're in Berkeley, but there's a universe. There's a universe all around us. And we, it's more than what we can even, we can even really comprehend in our mind, what's really going on around us. But we can still be foot soldiers. Here's the last one. The last truth here, the fifth one. The, the chief weapons of spiritual warfare. Here's the, here's the weapons of spiritual warfare. Humility, prayer, Knowledge, and I think this is the most important one, eh, for me anyway, perseverance. 
perseverance. Because this final point here is that is most encouraging for us. That since we can't see angels and the demons, right? We don't need to, we don't need to worry about what they're doing. Right? We don't need to, we don't need to be really worried about it because God's got that covered. Our part, here's our part. Here's your part. Here's my part as a church. We're to walk humbly before the Lord. There it is. Walk humble before the Lord. Give him your life. Remember we talked about control? Give control of your life over to the Lord. Give your control of your life over to the Holy Spirit. The Lord Christ, the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Seek his face in prayer. Seek his face in prayer. Grow in knowledge in the word of God. Keep growing in that book. Don't stay stagnant. Keep reading, keep reading, keep getting it written on your heart. God will change you. God might, he probably wants to use, I think he wants to use all of us right now, in the world we're in right now. This church could be a powerful witness to this community. I believe that in my heart. I truly do. I just keep praying, guys. Just keep praying for this church. I pray for all the churches right now. Pray for all the churches right now. That we grow in the knowledge of the word of God and also to persevere in that faithfulness, no matter how tough it's going to get, and it's going to get tougher. If you, I don't want to, things are going to get tougher. They are for us. It has to be that way because there's a plan. We know the plan. God, and I say this, God bless all those believers right now who have decided not to quit. Not to quit in the face of adversity. It's easy to quit when you're down. It's easy to quit when you're getting, getting beaten up and when you're getting discouraged. And when you're feeling lonely and when you're feeling hurt, that's adversity. It's easy to quit and say, ah, I'm done. I'm done with all this. And I bet you most of us have probably said that already in this life, right? We probably have. I'm, I'll give you the verse that I loved in this verse. In verse 19, he says, what does he say? Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, oh man. Highly esteemed. He said, peace. Be strong. Be strong now. That's the word in Daniel this morning. Hey, church, be strong. Be strong now. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the things that are all around us right now. It's hard. I get it. Because he says, that. look, he says twice, he says, be strong. As if he knows how tired Daniel is. Because Daniel, remember, Daniel was exhausted. Remember? He was exhausted. He says, be strong, Daniel. How easy it would have. How easy would it have been for Daniel to just give up? Just say, I quit. Lord, this is too much. You've given me too much on my plate. I can't handle it. I think sometimes we, we can all get into those situations. This is God's word for us today. Here's, I'm going to really, really end it here. I'll pose this to you guys right now. Are you under attack from the enemy? Never give up. Do you feel like quitting? Never give up. Are you fighting for your marriage? Never give up. Are you trying to be strong in the face of temptation? Never give up. Do you face criticism for doing what you know is right? Never give up. Are you tired of the struggle? God's word is clear. Never give up. Let the people of God, you guys take courage this morning. Take courage this morning. Keep your eyes on Jesus this morning. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Run to the cross when you feel faint. Run to the cross. Lean heavily on the Lord. That's why I'm encouraging you this morning. Are you tempted to quit? Pick up your armor. Get back in the battle. When the day is done, this, you'll be standing on victory side. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let nothing turn you aside this morning. Let nothing turn you aside this morning. Fear not and fight on. Fight on for Jesus Christ, the Lord, your Savior, our King, our Messiah. Never give up. Never give up and stand your ground this morning for Jesus Christ and never give up. Never. Amen. Let's praise the Lord this morning. And I say never give up and I think of these words this morning. Why shouldn't we give up? Because of this. And the scripture tells a whole story. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. 
That's why we don't give up, because we want to tell people that good news in our families, in the job, wherever we go. We don't give up. And if that's you this morning, this is called what God did here. He created redemption through the blood of His Son who hung on the cross at Calvary so that we may bridge that gap between that chasm between us and God, that sin chasm, the blood of Christ. And that's called a relationship. God says, come to me and I'll cleanse you. I'll wash you clean. He wants a relationship with you. You know what a relationship's about. You guys are all in relationships. That's what Jesus wants with you, that type of relationship, where you converse with him, you tell him everything on your heart, not hold anything back. I better not tell Jesus. You tell him everything. That's a relationship. No matter how silly you might think it is, no matter how uh, simple you might think it is, you tell him. That's a relationship. And you know what? God will embrace you. That's the God we have. That's the Jesus. But you can't have that relationship if you're still in sin. If you don't, Understand who he was and why he did what he did. And God made it, I don't want to say simple, but he put his son on the cross, he shed his blood, and then he was resurrected. He defeated sin. He defeated death for you, for me, for everyone. Every, you know what? Every house in this community that has people living in it, Jesus died for them. They might not know it. Maybe nobody told them. Maybe they rejected it. But that's not, that's not for me or you. We just bring the light. And that's what I'm bringing the light this morning. If you want a relationship with Jesus Christ, first thing you have to do, and you do have to do this, you got to turn away from sin, because that's what it is. Sin is death. If you want to continue to live in sin, you'll be separated from God. Turn away from your sin. Repent. And then believe. Believe in who he said he was, that he was crucified, buried, resurrected, the Son of God. And then call on his name. Just call on his name. Call on his name. Lord Jesus, I want you in my life. I believe you are who you say you are. You are the one true God, the one true way, the one true life. And then, you know what? Just receive in your heart. Believe in your heart. Because that's what it is. Get it out of here. Because most people, that's the, the thing that kind of constricts us, is our, our head sometime. Let it go here in your heart. If that's you this morning, go to our website, ccberkeley.org. Code, click on the prayer request. If you need a Bible, we'll send you a Bible. If you want to talk, my phone number's on there. I'll talk to you about Jesus anytime. And if that's someone here this morning, why don't you raise your hand? Not to raise your hand. If you want to come to the Lord this morning, or if this is the first time maybe you've heard these things, even in this book of Daniel, that maybe changed something in your heart this morning. If that's you this morning, raise your hand. You want a relationship with Jesus Christ this morning, with the risen Savior, who sits on the throne right to the right hand of God, praying for us right now, the Church of Berkeley. Raise your hand this morning. Not to raise your hand to say, hey, look at me. No, raise your hand, look up. Point your hand to the heavens. Say, I'm, I'm with you, Lord. I want to be with you, Lord. When I take my last breath, and we're all going to take our last breath. In that last breath, I want to be, you're going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. You're a follower of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a joy. Oh, what a, what a gift. What a gift God has given us. Right? It's called grace. Unmerited favor. We don't even deserve it. But God loves us. Just like the scripture told us, he loves us. For our struggle, the scripture says, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the powers, the world forces of this darkness, the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. And the scripture says, therefore, take up the full armor of God, the belt, Paul said, having your loins girt with truth. In other words, learn the scriptures. Learn the word of God. This is how we resist the devil. And then Paul said, put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now the breastplate was made of bronze backed with tough pieces of hide. And the breastplate of righteousness is what we get from Jesus Christ when we come to him as our Lord and Savior because our righteousness, our goodness is filthy rags in the sight of God and we receive the breastplate of righteousness so that when the devil shoots his fiery darts they can't penetrate that breastplate. And then thirdly he says having your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace it means that you should have the peace of God in your heart the serenity, the joy, the happiness that Christ gives should be in your heart so that when troubles come 
Satan will not be able to get close to you. And then fourthly, the Roman soldiers carried a shield. The scripture says, in addition to all taking up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming missiles of the evil one. Satan is always shooting his missiles and his darts at us. We need the shield of faith. Intellectually, you cannot come to Christ alone because your mind has a veil over it put there by the devil. But when you come to Christ, your mind is illuminated by the Holy Spirit and the things that you didn't understand before, you now accept by faith and you put on that helmet and that helmet protects you against the enemy. And then there's the sword and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's the offensive weapon. And the scripture says that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. When Satan tempted Jesus, Jesus used the sword, the word of God. And then the seventh and the last thing is to pray. Pray without ceasing, said Paul. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. Check your armor. Is it in place?